Hello, everybody. Welcome to take a fresh look at Edmund Bell. I'm Fiona Napier. I'm our International Sales Director. I'm Stephen Dobson, and I'm the Head of Contract in the UK for Edmund Bell. So we've got a series of, I think, 11 seminars, webinars for you over the next two days. Um, they're going to be looking at all sorts of different uh, topics, aren't they? They are indeed. We're going to cover quite a few technical things uh, that we hopefully find um, useful to you. Um, and we're going to cover them individually in a little bit more detail. If any of you attended our recent webinar that we did a few weeks back, um, we're going to just step out of that and just explore these things in a little bit more detail and obviously tell you a little bit more about the story of Edmund Bell. So the idea is whether you're a specifier, whether you're a contractor who works with specifiers, a wholesaler, we're going to try and touch on lots of relevant topics and try to help you sell to your customer or at least be relevant to your customer. Um, we're going to have panel discussions with uh, industry insiders from different sectors. We're going to be speaking to our fabric technologist, Ashley. We're going to have our designers on board to talk about trends. That's the next session. Uh, but right now, we are going to take you through what we think are the top 10 things that you might want to bear in mind when you're specifying or helping someone to specify contact fabrics. Absolutely. Yep. So we're going to take those in, in, in order of um, where we think um, the importance lies. So we're starting off with light control and uh, we're going to touch on FR standards. We're going to talk then a little bit about fabric sizing and also then how design fits on a fabric and uh, repeat things like this. Yeah, we're going to look at sound control and I think there's a lot of kind of uh, things on the market where we talk about acoustic sound absorption and trying to understand why that's important and why people look for that on a, on a certificate. Housekeeping needs, so uh, especially nowadays, increasingly in the period of COVID, uh, cleanliness and the way that you can clean our fabrics and uh, fabrics in the room. And various other things in terms of technical requirements, product longevity. So we do get a lot of questions about varying different fabrics where the, the durability of a fabric um, is highlighted by various different tests, things like light fastness, things like dimensional stability. Double rub and Martindale, things like this. We'll talk about that. We're going to explain a little bit about supply chain and why you should care about the supply chain behind a fabric. Uh, sustainability also plays into that. Uh, we put that at the end to keep you here <laughs> because everyone's really interested in sustainability at the moment. And then at the end, we're going to touch on stock availability. So even though we've gone through the last 10 months, which has been difficult for everybody, um, I think we've still got a few hurdles and challenges to come. Um, and it's just to talk to you about how we are better placed and why we would be a valuable partner to you. So one thing just to uh, say up front is, of course, um, there is going to be a little Q&A segment at the end. Um, because this is a webinar, very difficult to answer them throughout. So if you want, if you have any questions, pop them in the chat and we'll come back to them at the end. Uh, and any questions we don't get to answer in the session, we'll email you back and make sure you get an answer to your question. So I think first we, we want to bore you with a little bit of information about Edmund Bell's background and why it is that you would listen to us talking about, about contract fabrics at all. <laughs> Absolutely, so the, the business itself was established in 1855 uh, and started off producing apparel fabrics for the linings of, of suits, believe it or not. It feels like we've been around. Edmund Bell since about 1855. After the last 12 months, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, so as Stephen said, started off in apparel, um, moved then into more recognisably into linings, um, but it wasn't until the Second World War and the requirement for blackout, albeit very different blackout to what we have nowadays, um, really became apparent and moved Edmund Bell in the kind of direction that it, that it is now uh, set in. Absolutely, and in 2008 to where we are now, um, the Atherton family acquired the business um, with John and Brian um, running the ship. And I think we turned into a forward thinking business um, outside of that apparel commodity side um, to always strive to be better um, and always bring you uh, the latest trends in the marketplace and moving into more decorative avenues, I guess. So a point we're gonna come back to, I think when we talk about supply chain later on, but Edmund Bell is not a company on its own. It's actually part of a much bigger group of four companies. Um, and we're really blessed to have fabric finishing, so actual UK manufacture behind us, which is uh, something we bang on about all the time. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a 45 million pound group um, with all sorts of different technical knowledge and uh, yeah, key center points on it. Absolutely, and I think that just kind of brings us to where we are today. And some of the things that we talk about today and some of the issues that you will be encountering right now um, will be telling you why Evan Bell is in the perfect position to support you going forward. So 
Before we pass on to these key points for you to bear in mind when you're specifying or dealing with contract fabrics, we just want to highlight a little bit to you and why you should, again, why you should be taking us seriously, because we've got some really good brand names um, that rely on us actually in long term and large scale plans, such as those that you see on the on screen. So hotel brands, uh, cruise ship brands, we've got interiors retailers as well for upholstery, for example. Absolutely, big, big retailers and healthcare, um, you know, prison services, MOD, they, they, we cover pretty much um, every contract market as well as varying retail markets as well. And that's internationally. Um, you know, I think we sell uh, in 2019, certainly we were selling into over 55 countries. So again, the things that we're going to talk about today, they pertain not only to, I guess, some people out there will know as mainly for linings and some people out there will know as mainly for blackouts, uh, but everything we're talking about actually pertains to uh, the entirety of our product range. And it is a big one nowadays. It absolutely is. And I think you know, one of the biggest challenges for us was to change perceptions of Edmund Bell from this commodity driven um, blackout supplier. Um, into this whole world of decorative uh, interior design. And for those of you that have known us in the past, um, we've had two binders then, one that covered our lining products, one that covered our decorative blackouts and dim outs. And today, as you can see on the screen there now, we've got five uh, A4 binders, which, which split up um, very different sectors of what we do. With the aim that we give you a, a contract option, something that has every box ticked, in terms of stocking, in terms of price, in terms of certification and all the rest for every different product segment in your hotel room, your care home uh, yeah. room, whatever it is. And this was a natural byproduct really from the development that the investment was gone into the business um, where we couldn't put all of our contract products into one contract essentials binder as before. We split them out for your benefit. So you've got all your light control products, you've got your blackouts, dim outs and shears, your prints, weaves and upholstery products all in the same place. And in fact, we're going to come back in later um, sessions to the topic specifically of custom printing and upholstery because these are relatively new to most customers. So tune in to those later today and tomorrow. But without further ado, let's talk to you about some of these key things, these 10 key things that we think you might want to bear in mind when you're specifying contract fabrics. Yep, so we, we're starting off with, with light control, which generally from a drapery perspective is, is, is top of the list. And that's why they're there. Um, but why do we put so much effort into 100% into blackout products, into highlighted light protection to, to you guys in terms of specification? What are the main functions of, of a light control fabric? I think, um, well, many, the, the distinction between a blackout and a dim out is something that actually a surprising number of people have never been educated on. Uh, and that can be really key for you with your customers as well, can't it? It can, and I find that difficult myself sometimes, especially in the UK, uh, where we don't get a lot of light to blackout. Dark anyway. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the difference, the main difference between a blackout and a dim out is just purely down to the percentage um, of, of blackout um, or light exclusion. So that, this is a really good point and it's worth raising. We're going to talk about specific testing later on, but we tend to test light exclusion or opacity, sometimes it's called, on our dim out fabrics. Now our dim outs are three layer woven articles, right? They've got a face side, they've got a, a reverse, sometimes uh, the face and the reverse match, sometimes they don't, and they have a black inner layer. And that's what gives them a greater level of opacity or light exclusion than just a normal heavy fabric. We don't test opacity typically on our blackouts because almost we say, if we've called it a blackout, by definition, you should not have any visible light in the room. Yeah, and the, the process that we, we go through in terms of blackout, again, we'll get deeper into that as the next couple of days go, goes on. Um, but in essence, a blackout fabric or decorative blackout fabric has had all the tiny holes within that base cloth fabric filled in. So there will be 100% light exclusion. Mm -hmm. We, um, we are going to talk about this later. We're going to be talking about our UK manufacturing processes. So that might be an interesting one to tune into. Uh, we've got some footage and some photos of our plant. Uh, but yeah, our blackout is um, three or four past acrylic blackout. So essentially uh, we pull back with three layers of acrylic, white, black, white, and we flock it in a very technical, very long process uh, in order to do, as, as Stephen says, to completely fill every hole in that fabric so that when it's hung, you should not see any light. Yeah, and stereotypically, you know, the blackouts get a bad name because historically they've been quite stiff. 
Um, but as Fiona said there, we do put a, a flock in on the outside of this now, so it's really soft to handle. It drapes that, that much better. If you haven't already seen our Sensation Velvet Blackout, check it out. It's, it's beautifully soft. And in fact, the advances that we've made in coating the Sensation, we've carried over to our next upcoming article, Quantum, which we will tease you about later. Um, <laughs> so I think um, one thing that we, we've brought up on screen there is that when you're dealing with a dim out, there are certain factors that can influence quite how much it, it dims the light. Uh, things like the direction of the room. So if it's a south facing room, you are going to see more light through, of course, depending on the time of day. Uh, the time of year in certain places more than others is yeah. going to influence that too. But the blackout is black and that's it. Uh, and that's why many four plus star hotels require 100% blackout because they have airline crews and all sorts of people coming in. That's the key message I try to get across to, to customers when it comes to blackout. When you're asking about why should I use blackout over a dim out, and, and then you get into, into blackout lining. And the reason is quite simple. If, you, if you're looking for a four star or above with hotels in, in particular, it has to be as dark in the day as it is at night mm -hmm. in that room. Um, and it's that simple. So lastly, I think we want to just touch on shear and why we, why we call them light control at all. I think with shear, shears typically have three different functions. Um, they have uh, an exclusion function in terms of um, atmospheric um, things, so whether it's mosquitoes or a breeze or whatever it is. They give you a bit of privacy as well. Uh, it means you can have the blackout curtains open, still get light through, but you know, you can wander around as naked as you like in your hotel room. Shocking. <laughs> Not that I do. <laughs> um, and also, of course, um, ambience. So you might be using them, whether in a hotel room, whether in a public space, you might just use them to filter the light, to give it a softer, a softer ambience. It is, and it all depends what type of room. If, if, you, if, you're, if you're decorating your, your areas, or communal areas, then a shear will let alone enough light through to give you that natural light. Um, and in the bedrooms, a shear generally is that backup or that privacy side of things. Um, as well as well as an aesthetic look as well. If you like, it's almost in a, in a way, it's an extension of this biophilic trend that we're going to talk about in the next in the design trend segment. Um, you don't just need you don't just need green world walls. You need a bit of light in your life, don't you? Especially Absolutely. when we're indoors so much at the moment. Especially now, definitely. Yeah. So uh, next up uh, is a little drier, <laughs> but very important uh, and really something that sets us apart and is a key niche is FR or flame retardant standards. Yeah, and I think this is where we could have really bored you senseless with, <laughs> with certificates and, and, and all sorts of numbers and, and letters, but I think it's quite key to understand who Edmund Bell are and almost why we exist. And we exist because we are experts in this side of things. And no matter what fabric you're specifying, and no matter what um, room it's going into, what sort of market sector you're using it for, we will have fabrics that will meet the requirements that you're looking for. And there's a lot of them. There sure are. So I think um, what Stephen drew out in our previous discussion about this was my first thought in terms of different flame retardant standards is different from market to market. So German, uh, Germany has the B1 standard for drapery. Uh, France may use EN, so European class one or M1, depending on the setting. Um, so there's, there's those, there's marine IMO if, you, if you're doing ships. But actually there's, you know, even within countries, often differing requirements for different usages, whether it's top of bed or accessories, and there's drapery, upholstery, the UK is terrible. No, it, is, it is terrible. I, I came across one in France, actually, did a, we did a Hilton Hotel in France where, um, you know, actually the bedrooms, it doesn't have to be, didn't have to be FR at all, but because it was in a public area, they had to be M1, and it was, it was such a minefield. Different it's a minefield, situation. that's the key thing. Yeah, I mean, when you get into topics like marine uh, certification, that really is something else. So what we're keen to kind of point out is, yes, there are a lot of different requirements, um, and in, in truth, it's something that sets us apart. It allows us to set ourselves apart. Um, you'll see on the reverse of our pattern cards and samples, and on our tech spec sheets, uh, all of these different standards listed. And we don't expect you to necessarily want to know or care what a BS5867 five, uh, five, part 2B is. Um, yeah, we know. So we, we, we think we know. <laughs> we definitely know. And it's the, you know, the difference between B and C even is it's quite, quite, quite confusing. So the key thing really to bear in mind is um, what, where is it going in terms of what country are you going to be actually installing these goods? 
what is going to be the usage of the goods? Is it going to be a chair? Is it going to be a bed runner? Is it going to be a, a curtain or blind, something else? Is that something to bear in mind as well? It is, and I think the one thing to take from this um, is that that's really all we need you to do. Um, mm. You can pass that off to us and we will make sure that the fabrics we show you um, or give you as options cover those FR standards that we need to. One final point. Certificates have validity periods. I'm sure this is something that comes up all the time. Yeah, so these are actually showing on screen. We're going to have a few different certificates. Um, for example, the German B1 uh, article. There's a whole bunch of different ones there. Um, yeah, they have validity periods. Often it's five years, for example. They can run out. Now, we make sure that um, as, as relevant, we keep ours up to date and we keep renewing them so you can be confident in the longevity of the product. Absolutely. They're all available to you. So when you're handing over a project um, and you've got to you know, get all your paperwork together, all of these certificates are, are available to you within in those dates um, so that you've got those things signed off. So this is a tricky one to explain, uh, but I think it's a really important point that people often overlook, mm. uh, which is, yes, as the title suggests, fabric comes in a set size and in a set direction. Um, so especially important when you're looking at um, either tall rooms where you need really long curtains uh, or wide curtains even or also large patterns and pack and repeat and there's lots of things to take into consideration here it's not as simple as that's a fabric or i can get that in a double width that's fine i'll just get that you've got to understand that if there's got a directional pattern in it that will that will make a difference if you're if you're making those ceiling to floor curtains and it's just borderline on the width and you're wanting to, to kind of railroad your products, you, you might you want to explain enough. railroad. So you don't know what railroad I'll is. Leave that to you. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a nice diagram on the screen here that explains railroading a little bit um, with, the, with the help of a stripe because a stripe is obviously the most directional design you can get. Um, and really, what's important is you know how many seams are there going to be in this curtain, uh, and you know how how wide is your room. It may be that uh, it might suit you the best. Uh, to have the non-railroaded article that you see at the bottom of the screen here, where a, a stripe runs the entire length of the roll. A roll of fabric could be 30, 50, 100 metres long, depending on the article. So it might suit you the best to do that. It might only be 140 centimetres wide, it might be 280. Um, and then railroaded would be having the, the stripe running from selvage to selvage, so the width of the fabric. Uh, and there's different situations. You might, you know, that, that might be actually better use of the fabric for you. Again, tricky for you to know this. It's, it's very tricky. It, it can be an economical decision. It, yeah. can, it can be a decision on aesthetics. You might have a client that has requested that they don't want any joins in their curtains. Something if simple it's blackout, time. that's a dead important thing often because you, you want to reduce the number of seams and places where light can, can uh, come in. And, and I, and I was explaining to one of my colleagues yesterday about, about the fullness of a curtain. You know, you know, if you're using wave track systems, the fullness of that curtain has to be spot on, otherwise those waves won't fall properly from, from the ceiling to the floor mm -hmm. and they'll start going out at the bottom and the fabric width and the amount of fabric you need is all, all determined by these factors. And then I think the, the other thing to talk about here is repeat of design. Um, we have, as I'm going to show you here, um, this is a good example. What we often do now is we when we do uh, a design, you know, a geometric design, an abstract design, whatever it may be, we consider carefully the, the repeat size. Um, in fact, we have a couple in the Soho Club uh, and Sanctuary collection where we actually have two, almost two different repeat sizes of the same kind of pattern uh, to give you the choice. Um, larger patterns might look great in a big space, they make you know, a real statement, uh, but they might not be as suitable in a small space, who knows, mm -hmm. uh, or for your particular requirements. So this is definitely worth bearing in mind as well. And it's quite useful that Fiona is actually holding up a cushion there because these sorts of fabrics generally are used for the accessories and, and the accents that you're putting in the room. So it could be a cushion, it could be a larger cushion, it could be for a runner, Yeah. Um, all these sorts of things. And taking those repeats into account for you is really important because understanding those repeats as, a, as an impact on ultimately the budget you know, if you, if you can get one one cushion out of a metre of fabric out of one product, um, then obviously that's going to save you money. If, or the alternative, if you're having to buy two metres of fabric for a cushion. If you're interested in this kind of thing, the talk that we're doing uh, on print labs, or a custom printing option, might be interesting to you. There's one of the nice things about that is we can completely customise repeat. You can take a design already existing and completely change the repeat, the colour, anything about it. 
uh, or indeed you could have something built up from the ground up for yourself. Yeah, even change the scale completely, uh, the options are there. Okay, so we're moving on um, to sound control. Um, so again, sound control can be uh, mistaken where you're thinking it's something that blocks out sound. Okay, so yes, that, that does happen. Uh, but more importantly now, um, the acoustic sound of a room, it, it's all the experience of a room. Yeah. Um, it's, it's much more important now. You might, I mean, in certain circumstances, you might actually want an echo um, to, to give a sense of space. You can tell this is quite a big space because it's echoing in here, despite all the fabrics we've got in here. Um, especially nowadays where there's more of a tendency towards minimalism in design than I think there was previously. Uh, there often is laminate or wood flooring, hard flooring. Um, you really need to make sure that any soft furnishings you do use are doing their best to absorb sound in the space, especially if you're wanting it to have a, a cosier, more compact feel. Definitely, and I think you know even this down to something simple as the TV. You know the, the slim TVs that are put in the, in the hotel hotel rooms these days. They, they they're built to have some sort of Bluetooth soundbar or the only system around the room at home. So they're very tinny, and they've read the sound of those TVs are, 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 are you know they they're, they're quite bad. So in terms of the acoustics of the room, having a drapery product in that room that gives you that sound absorbency actually helps you all experience in terms of the hotel. That's it. And we're talking about hotel rooms a lot here, but actually I would say quite often our acoustic fabrics get used and things like office spaces, you know, they'll be used on panels where they're used in conjunction with foam to, to capture the most possible sound. Um, so, so one thing to obviously bear in mind is in your very minimalist room set, where else can you be using fabric? You know, um, is faux leather necessarily, or leather necessarily the best choice for a headboard. Uh, it won't capture sound in the same way as a textured fabric will, for example. Um, but no, we have really, we're quite lucky, we have a couple of really, really um, strongly performing fabrics in terms of acoustic absorbency. We test those articles at the University of Salford down the road from us. Um, they give us a very long, complicated report uh, that I, I hand to Ashley, our fabric technologist. Uh, but the last page, very clear, it gives you a um, basically a, a letter, A being the best, and then so forth, uh, downward. Now, we actually have an A rating on our um, expression development. Okay. And in fact, all of our double width dim outs, we have um, acoustic absorbency certification for as well. So this is a herringbone dim out, those are different colors, double width 300 centimeters or 150. And apart from uh, having acoustic absorbency it also has Ecotex 100 plus a, a, a rake of different uh, performance features. <laughs> Which you will elaborate on. And this one is also worth remembering. We already mentioned uh, Sensation Velvet Blackout, a gorgeous project, uh, product we've been working on for a very long time. This has been recently tested for acoustics too. Yep. So I think it's key to remember that all of our dim up fabrics come with a, with a sound absorbency uh, classification that comes with a certificate alongside it. As you can, Fiona has just told you, we start to move on into our deck of blackouts now as well. So it's something as a business we're, we're taking seriously for your benefit. So next point that we're going to go over is housekeeping. Obviously, um, the you know this is not something that is going to be first thing to mind when you're designing or, or talking with an owner, let's say, about a care home room, about a hotel room. The first thing you're going to think about is the aesthetic of it. You know, are the colours right? Uh, is it giving off the vibe that I want it to? Obviously, care home even more so than anywhere else, but in many different settings, it's really important that the product that you put in there, whether it is fabric, whether it, but if, if it's any other aspect of, uh, um, you know, furnishings yeah. and equipment, uh, is cleanable, is going to stand up to the rigours of, of cleaning. Yeah, absolutely. And part, part of our new look collateral um, and our sampling uh, provision to you guys is, that we make these things really, really clear for you. Um, so you, you will have occasions where you require a stain resistant fabric. It may need to be wipeable, bleach cleanable even. You may need to want, want to steam it, it needs to be ironed, it needs to be washable, dry cleanable. Yeah. Do you have a durable FR finish or a non-durable FR finish? You know, these are the things um, that you need to take into consideration. And all of our products not only are tested um, before washing, but they tested after washing. So you get a dimensional stability certificate or you get you know, an option 
to let you know where that shrinkage rate is after you watch it, watch at the temperature. So we're going to come back to this point briefly uh, under the sustainability heading. But one thing we see quite uh, happening quite often in, in contract is uh, a retail, so a non-flame retardant, maybe natural fiber article being chosen for a, for a fabric, and it being then retroactively uh, uh, treated yeah. with chemicals to make it flame retardant. And um, so as Stephen mentioned, that's not then inherently flame retardant. Uh, when you wash it, the flame retardancy either is removed entirely or certainly reduces. Yeah, and I think it's a question I get asked quite a lot, um, is for an inherent FR fabric. And I think what, what's happened in terms of terminology there is people are confusing the word inherent with FR as, as being standard, it's not standard. Mm -hmm. um, we will have inherent FR fabrics, but we will also have fabrics that are durable durably flame retardant there, and there is a difference and I think what Fiona touched on there is, is quite key that especially in the specification world where you've got an abundance of retail fabrics and there's, there's so many to choose from if you choose one of those fabrics how do you know that that's going to be durably FR finished how, how do you know what it will look like how do you know how it will react to that finishing process? It's because it's a chemical process at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. And then the wash, the subsequent washing, which is almost certainly going to take place at least a few times during its life in that setting. And when when does it become non FR? At yeah. what point are you taking that risk yeah. by using a, a domestic retail product? Not only FR, but you mentioned also uh, dimensional stability there. Mm. So, one of the nice things about polyester, um, it turns out, is the dimensional stability is great, meaning when you wash it, when you dry clean it, it doesn't shrink very much. Uh, and obviously a, a natural fibre, as you'll know yourself probably from having a wool, a wool jumper in the, the washing machine, or your husband having done that anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, just goes to show who does the washing at home, Stephen. <laughs> the roll bread stop. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so if, you, you know, if you've done that, you realise you know, natural fibres tend to have more shrinkage, they tend to shrink more. Um, so you can end up with a curtain that is, uh, I guess, warped. Yeah. And you know what, you've touched on something there that you know sometimes I often get asked, a lot of contract fabrics are polyester. And the simple fact is that polyester is a man-made product, but it's stronger. It doesn't shrink, it shrinks less. It can be an errant FR. There's it's lots errant. of advantages to The, the colour fastness and colour continuity between batches is great. Um, <laughs> so yeah, really important. So we're going to touch here on some additional technical requirements. We've already talked about, you know, washing, cleaning requirements. We've talked about uh, flame retardancy, which is really like a government mandated requirement. Uh, but depending on the setting that you're going to use your fabric in, you may have a, a raft of other requirements that are set either by the client, by the government locally, um, any number of different things, just, just by the, you know, the needing longevity from your, from your product. Absolutely right, and I think the top example we give you there is a chair in a lobby versus a guest room. You know, it seems quite a simple thing really to think about, doesn't it? It's all to do with you know, the traffic in terms of your guests. You know, I, you... I think that, so Martindale then being the, the abrasion kind of testing for Europe and the UK, mm -hmm. and Weizenbeek double rub tends to be what's used in the States, sometimes in Asia. Um, there's, there's a certain dogmatic uh, aspect to those people tend to have a figure in their mind for what they use, what their firm uses. It's forty thousand. We always need forty thousand Martindale, or uh, we need a hundred thousand. Uh, and actually, um, understanding the differences between those tests um, and, and actually what they mean uh, is important for you because it'll dictate what you can, you know, what you can choose. It is, and it has a you know that Martindale reference can be misleading. And I think you know officially a Martindale test is done. You, you rub a piece of fabric onto that fabric many times until three threads break. Why don't you all the way? They need to come to Ashley's, to come to Ashley's <laughs> uh, session <laughs> later on. To talk about it. It's, you know, that's, that's the rule of it. And I think when you've got something like a vinyl or full leather, it's a bit misleading because it's going to fade quite quite heavily before it even gets to the threads. That's a very good point. So, yeah. you know, even looking at those sorts of things in terms of market day requirements, the number that you look at might look high, but it, it can can't yes, yeah, to. because there's two aspects, as you say, to that. There's, there's the colour fastness aspect, and there's the Absolutely. thread breakage. Yeah. There's no threads to break on a velvet, on a sorry, on a uh, on a leather. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah. So key, and what you you know, in terms of it, in a guest room, as everyone very well knows, guest room chairs pretty much are used as wardrobes. And I certainly almost never sit in them. They get clothes thrown over them, don't they? they do. So in truth, the the number of 
uh, of rubs that they will take uh, in this lifetime is much less than something in a guest room or a food and beverage setting. Uh, and so you need to think accordingly about the requirements. It may be that you can have that really fancy uh, fabric in the guest rooms or certainly on the back of the chair, on the arms of the chair as opposed to on the seat. So all we're thinking about. It is, and I, I guess what we're trying to say to you is that we realise your job's difficult. You know, if you're if you're designing an old room setting or an old brand you know, complete building with guest areas and lobbies, yep. you've got lots of things to think about. Don't need to think about these things. You just need to give us your brief, tell us what you need, the colours that you're looking for, yep. and we'll almost do the rest for you. Yeah, and we, we've seen some of these uh, these brand books, and they're obscenely long. You know, you're having to pay an awful lot of attention to you know, a copper door handle. <laughs> yeah. You can't be thinking about everything to do with the fabrics as well, so worth handing it over. Absolutely. Um, so another thing that you want to bear in mind is this question of, of light control. Um, you know, in, a, in an office space, for example, we don't have blackout of the windows in this particular room, no need to do so, but in a seminar or a meeting room where you're using uh, projectors, of course, it's going to be really important. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So you, you, you guys will understand where the type of room and the functionality of the, of the fabric. Um, and again, just, just let us know there's, there's lots of different standards that you know, we've only gone through what probably half of what we're going to talk to you about in this session. Um, and already the technical side of things to start stepping up. And that's why we're here. I think I just want to touch briefly on, on uh, bleach cleanable in a little more uh, detail as well. Um, we are going to come back in a later session to talk about technical upholstery. I think it's actually the last session tomorrow. <laughs> Um, and we'll be talking there about our sub-brand um, Enduracare Plus and Enduracare. Um, and those basically encompass different finishes, different uh, um, performance finishes for upholsteries that we have. Bleach cleanable is just a whole other level, isn't it? It, it kind of is, and it's, it's something that we, we, we need to understand better and we need to provide more information on. Uh, but it's something that we're working towards because there's a lot of, you can have a lot of fabric that's antimicrobial, that's stain resistant, all of these things. But ultimately, if they can't be cared for in the correct way in, in the environment they're going in, then, then it's a difficult that's environment it. to bleach, do. Bleach cleanable, again, is a little bit like when, when people have a set in Martindale or, or Wisenby double uh, rub requirement. Um, sometimes it's valid, sometimes it isn't. Um, so this Enduracare Plus finish, for example, is antimicrobial already. It's tested to, to various different standards and requirements. Um, and it may be that in a guest room, you don't need to be using a bleach solution to clean your, your chair. You no, know? <laughs> it may not be necessary. Yeah. This, we've already done the technical work for it. Um, and it could be as simple as sponging within 24 hours um, with, with, a, with a clean with a clean cloth. But yeah. So, so water, throw those questions out, definitely. Absolutely. So we have, we've talked about hygiene and we've talked about uh, certain tests and technical requirements that um, maybe underline uh, how long um, an article is going to last in the setting you've put it in uh, and how well it's going to look at the end of that period, the period that it's been in there for. Well, product longevity, I think, is really important for a number of reasons. If you're a specifier, then it's really important because often those specs don't go into play, they don't actually get built into a hotel, a care home, uh, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, ship for a number of years. Yeah. And one thing we come up against quite often is that, um, you know, people have spec something and then two years down the line, whatever they spec is, they're discontinued. Yeah. Edmund Bell's quite nice in that in that respect because we don't have a, you know, thousands of SKUs. We instead have uh, a collection that is meant for to last long time. Stopped for a long time. It was developed for the contract market, and if there's nothing else you take out of this today, is just remember that. Um, you know, we, we are here for you. That's the whole reason that Bell exists, um, is to provide these contract fabrics. And there's a lot of information on the back of the pack card, and the mistake a lot of people make is that they go straight to that one thing. So if you're looking for an upholstery fabric, is that Martin Dill above 40,000? Yes, it is. That's fine. But there's an abundance of other, other technical information on there that should help you make a decision. You know, we've got it on the screen there in terms of pilling tests, stain resistance. Can it be washed? Can it be bleach clean? Yeah. Um, can it be white cleaned? Um, what's the colour fastness when it is washed to light? You know, there's all sorts of different factors. So that colour fastness point is one that we haven't really touched on in this way yet, which is um, what, what this is getting at is um, the reverse of your curtain is you know, if you're not in the UK, <laughs> it's going to be subject to some sun. <laughs> um, Sensitive <of> tone, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit grim here today. Um, but yeah, so it's going to be subject to a load of sun. If you're the Dominican Republic, you lucky duck. 
uh, then it's going to be you know sunny a lot of the time and that fabric is eventually going to uh, be subject to the sun's rays and it's going to discolor and um, and because obviously especially curtains are waved typically certain areas will discolor more than others and you get striping um, so you firstly you want to ideally choose uh, an article for a face that has good color fastness to light yeah. uh, and or you want to think about using a lining uh, and uh, or at least certainly providing for the workroom to use a lining that's definitely worthwhile that's something that can you know take a, a product that will look good for, for five years and make it last a lot longer again and Absolutely. we're all about sustainability and i'm sure that's coming up shortly so it's worth worth bearing in mind <laughs> And moving on from, from product longevity, um, we're looking at um, you know, what we've suggested in the years, choosing the correct supply chain partners. Um, so I think, you know, when you're specifying fabrics, it's quite easy to just go for the basics and look at your fabric choices, look at your things like your Martindales and your FR standards, tick all of those boxes. But but why why work with Edmund Bell over anybody else or our competitors, I guess? Um, and for you guys, it's important that you've got someone at the end of the phone or the end of an email that you trust and that will give you the right answers that will get you what you need in time that, that if that you know heaven forbid if you have a complaint that they will respond in a quick manner <laughs> yeah absolutely I mean, not everybody's perfect you know there are mistakes that happen it's how we respond to them not me. <laughs> never you feel <laughs> <laughs> um, but i think for you guys it's, you've got to have that accessible experts on hand is what we put there and i think that doesn't do, just involve um, ourselves, who are the external face inside of Edmund Bell, we've got a whole team of various sales managers. We've got a team of customer service guys in the office here up in Rossville. Got a design team as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We'll meet hopefully. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. Um, next very next session. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the the idea is we're always forward thinking towards contracts, towards what specifier needs, towards what the contractor needs, and the end you know the end user needs as well, uh, and trying to anticipate that and plan for that in the long term as well. Yeah, and I think our, our vision at Evan Bell has always been more about being not just being a supplier. Being a supplier is easy. Anybody can be a supplier. Um, we want to be a partner. Um, we want to treat your business as if it's our own. Um, and everybody throughout the business has that kind of ethos built into them. Um, things like we're doing today, we wouldn't be able to do without our marketing team all behind the, behind the cameras here today. But th there's a whole team of people behind the scenes that are here ultimately for you. So I know a topic close to many people's hearts right now is sustainability. We've touched on a few little points uh, in this direction through the talk. Um, I think sustainability is on everything now, isn't it? Consumer adverts, whether it's fabric uh, softener or whether it's anything, anything. Starbucks cups, yeah. Starbucks cups, yeah. Everything is, everyone's talking about sustainability quite rightly. Um, and that's definitely something you should be hopefully bearing in mind when you spec or you buy a fabric as well, I would hope, or any interior furnishing article. Um, so, you know, there's many different things we're trying to do in this regard. Um, yeah, and I think that's important. I think Ashley's going to spend a bit more time later on, isn't he, going into more detail about what we're actually doing right now. So that's the, the technical selling uh, with fabric technologist uh, segment. What time is that, Annie? Mean? Tomorrow. Tomorrow wow. at uh, 11 a.m. 11 a.m. GMT. So we'll get into more detail, but I think just for today and for this purpose now is to bear in mind that sustainability is, is it's not as simple, and I keep saying this, it's not as simple as providing a fabric that's made from recycled polyester, because anybody can go out and buy that. Sustainability is, is literally, for us as a business, it's business-wide, it's group-wide, actually. And actually, again, we'll, we'll touch on that later on today and it's looking at the options that are out there in terms of recycled product um, but you'll notice that if you have our pattern cards there you'll notice we touched on ecotech standard 100 a day and um, we're all about you know the amounts of most of our woven fabrics last few years they're all being tested for 100 chemicals that are harmful to human beings and i think we've been doing that for years actually really. for it, yeah, so, yeah. every year we've been ramping up the number of, of our products that appear on the Ecotech certificate um, I think the new one's going to feature almost 60, so a real a load of them. We're actually trying to get our blackouts on there as well. That's uh, a thing, you know, it's a very technical uh, product, blackout, um, and it involves many, many processes to be audited. So uh, that's something we like to put there. So, so that's chemicals usage and making sure that in terms of human uh, uh, use, yeah. uh, our articles are safe, as safe as, as the clothes that you wear, for example. Yeah. Um, also, we have also 
talked about certification already, and that's, I think, a really key sustainability issue, again, to do with chemicals usage. When you choose expression dimmer, when you choose sensation blackout, our repositories, whatever, they're already flame retardant and certificated to meet the standards you need. There's no need to apply additional chemicals to spray them with God knows what, um, then might actually leach off during washing. Um, they already fulfill these standards and they are wherever possible inherent so that actually no additional chemical has been applied. They're inherent because the yarn itself melts away from flame. Yeah, and I think you know it's important just to reaffirm that you know that sustainability it is a huge business wide commitment for us. Um, and even down to maybe a carbon footprint of very important fabrics. And let's let's you know be quite clear and upfront here. Having contract flame retardant fabrics and sustainability in the same conversation is difficult. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not easy yeah. uh, because of the, main, the nature of the beast, I suppose. It, it'd be great if we all had linen, cotton, wool products that we could all use, but quite frankly, they're so expensive. That... Yeah, although one of the things that a customer recently put to me was, and it is true, and we do tout that, you know, on our cotton linings, we tout it as a benefit, you know, it's a natural product, yeah. everyone likes to hear that. but. Water usage is considerably lower on uh, polyester uh, production than it is on natural fibres. So that's something to bear in mind as well. So there's a lot to think about. But what you said, Stephen, there, one of the key points we're trying to quantify at the moment is to do with uh, yeah, transport and carbon footprint. Yes. So one of the nice things about having UK production for the blackouts, the linings and the upholsteries is we're transporting considerably less weight from the Far East than nearly every other supplier of, of fabrics in Europe. Absolutely. Um, and or the states, um, because we have this native manufacture, it means that only the grange, only the unfinished base cloth uh, is transported. Now, in the case of, let's say, Zanzibar Blackout, it's one of our best sellers, that's the difference between 240 grams finished weight per linear meter, or per square meter, pardon me, yeah. and 70 grams. Now, if you, you know, cube that out. It's more than three times as much. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we're trying to get some figures on that. It'd be really interesting to see. Nice stuff, nice stuff. <laughs> but, we, but we're getting there and as you can see from all of those things we are trying to get away from just having that one marketable approach yeah. um, to sustainability um, it's, it's a business-wide commitment for us and our, uh, actually our, our, our fabric technologist has quite a background in sustainable oh, projects so I'm trying so hard to hold a lot of it back because I don't want to steal it so I'll, I'll leave, leave to actually tell you all about that so one of the absolute key selling points, I think, of Edmund Bell is stock availability. Um, there are certain times of year, as anyone in this trade will know, that put a special uh, pressure on supply chain for fabrics and, in truth, anything coming out of the Far East. Um, and that's why it's kind of nice that we have additional elements to our, our supply chain, because we can buffer that to an extent. Uh, so firstly, we, you know, we uh, plan heavily in advance uh, for, you know, things like Chinese New Year, New Year and other factors that uh, um, affect. Yep. But also the fact we have UK manufacturing means we keep large quantities of base cloth of the yeah. Austrian blackout. I, I think that's the big thing here. The reason we put this into this today is because it's quite relevant for the year and now, I guess. And I think Fiona touched on the weight difference of 70 grams per square meter to 240 grams per square meter for a bit of product, is that we can actually bring in a lot more base cloth and hold it at our production facility and hold finished stock here so that we can also be your point of contact for those large projects. You may find it difficult over the next few months um, in getting hold of those two, three thousand meters of fabric that you need that need to be technical in the ways we've described them today. Oh, we are having discussions internally to try to um, give you options for large single quantities with you know, short lead times. There'll always be an option here. And I think the key message for you is, even if it's six months away and you think you don't need to talk about it yet, you do. Tell us, talk tell us. us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but we are, we're, we're already, you know, hoping that there is going to be a boom after COVID uh, finally it's gone a bit. goes away. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> with, there are, there are, I think, there is certainly a feeling of optimism in certain markets. Uh, and so we're trying to be prepared for that. We're yeah. trying to make sure when it does come, when, when the sign-off does come for you, that you have an option with us. It's, 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 yeah, it's a slight risk, risk, but it's the risk we're willing to take for, for you guys, really. So we, again, it's going back to not just being a supplier and coming back with what the computer says. It's, it's actually working with you, partnering with you, planning a project with you, putting your schedules in place, ensuring we meet deadlines between you and your contractors, your fitters, 
um, and that your client ultimately is pleased with your service. Um, and that's how important you guys are to us. So here's a little summary of why it is you might think of us when you are specifying or dealing with contract fabrics. Um, so obviously, as we suggested at the start, we have a really comprehensive range now uh, and it's filling up all the time. You know, we already have a really good range there of, of blackouts, divouts and shears, but also uh, increasing range of jacquards and woven articles for top of bed, for accessories and cushions. We can fill that control book for you, I'm sure we can. Definitely, you don't need anything to come to us. <laughs> and a lot of our products of UK origin, and that's, again, we're not touching on that too much, we can go into a bit more detail about that for the next couple of days. But that's going to have an impact in terms of things that, that are happening around, around Europe and around the world. Um, and that's a result of our, our, our finishing and coating plant that we have um, available to us. And again, just builds in the investment and the infrastructure that Edmund Bell have around it. So we make sure that as relevant to the product, all of our articles are cleanable uh, for the, you know, the kind of places that you might be putting them. Um, so, you know, we do have washable, we have dry cleanable, we have steamable and ironable and bleach cleanable articles in the range uh, to suit your needs. Yeah. Um, and then touching on pricing, um, our prices, pricing is some of the best in the market. It is. Um, again, we have a team of production experts upstairs that their sole job is to be make sure that they're purchasing the right products at the right price that's commercially, commercially viable for you. Yeah. Um, and that's put us in great positions in the past. Um, but I think now we're, we're, we're looking at a project from the beginning, or from its infancy stage, you can be confident that that, that spec is never going to get far mentioned. And again, even, you know, um, we obviously are bearing uh, in mind the fact that budgets are going to be under Hunter, even yeah. more pressure now than they ever were before. Yeah. So making, you know, uh, new articles available, which you will see in subsequent sessions, um, new articles available that really respond to those requirements. Yeah, and scary duties that are out there at the minute in different taxes for various different countries, various different products. Again, yes, there'll be an impact, but you'll be remarkably surprised when you see a product, how, how little impact it will have. On well, and in fact, I think worth mentioning there for any European customers of ours that Edmund Bell is basically swallowing these costs and trying to make it as streamlined and simple for you as possible. So it's going to be some short term pain for us, but. <laughs> We love our EU customers. So, um, so of course, certification, um, whether it is, uh, you know, drapery, whether it's upholstery, whether it is for the hotel sector, for care, for marine, whether it's for Germany, for in Southeast Asia, wherever you are, uh, we basically should have the certification for you. And if we don't have the very specific Canuck Canadian certification or whatever it is that you're looking for, then please get in touch because we're always willing to take care. Um, and also, as we touched on, um, we've got sound absorbency and certification that goes alongside that. And the high temperature washing, so if you need to be washing for thermal disinfection, if you're washing at 71 degrees, we've got the test to prove what happens when that happens. And it's not as simple as it can be. We actually tell you what to expect in terms of how the fabric performs after it's washed at that temperature. Um, and we've got that eco certification as well. We'll be working on the Ecotech standard 100. Again, these are all certified claims. They are not something we've just thought up, these things have been certified and put in place before uh, uh, we've launched a product. And then last but obviously not least, after all these promises and the paperwork we've made available, we actually do have goods <laughs> for you to, to order and to, to be delivered for your projects and we try to keep stocks in line with what we think you're going to require. And I don't know how you guys feel, but I definitely feel more optimistic and positive this time this year than I did six months ago. Um, so we're preparing for that. Yes, risky, but we're preparing it um, and we're preparing it for you. So if you've enjoyed listening to us talk for an hour uh, and you want to find out more, there are several different places you can go. You can go to our normal website, edmundbell.com, or you could sign up and uh, ask for request um, access to fabric-hub.com, uh, which is a multimedia platform that gives you actually all the information we'll be talking about, certifications, tech spec, thumbnail images, room images, videos, loads of stuff yeah. all about our product range. And Fabric, and let's face it, even though there's optimism and positivity and there's that light at the end of the tunnel right now, um, we're still working in a very virtual world. And so Fabric Hub will give you those, uh, those JPEG, high resolution images, will give you access to our pattern cards, the certification. And quick answers. And quick answers yeah, to your questions and, and obviously you can just fire specifics over to us to get cracking for you. Super. 
Do we have any questions, Adam? Was well, um, we mentioned our return um, process that we got our returns fabrics for because we were recycling. recycling. Yeah. Um, is that available now, and can people do it? Now? In the UK. Yeah. 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 So um, for I think ninety percent of the meters that we sell, um, actually our fabric technologist has already put in place a process for um, yeah returning curtains when they're at the end of their life, and they are processed then into carpet underlay. So they become a totally useful product, a product for a second time. And we've actually found somebody who does that for us that's literally on our doorstep. Um, so there's no extra delivery and carbon footprint involved in delivering to the far flung corners of the world. Yeah. Um, it's happening right on our doorstep in the UK and it's been, as Fiona said, it's been recycled into another product that then has been sold and used. And the process is free, so it is just return shipment, uh, which obviously within the UK should be minimal. So. Actually, we'll bring more about that. Yeah, 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 again, we don't want to steal this stuff. Stealing this money, he's crossing everything he's going to talk about. That. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question um, <clears throat> bleach cleaning, uh, bleach cleanable fabrics. Um, somebody was just asking, do we have that already available? Um, so. yeah, at present, just the one article, yeah. um, because it is quite, I mean, it's quite niche, quite specific, especially like maybe care, you know, that kind of situation. Um, Metro. I'm not going to drag the chair over, we will actually show you it in the subsequent session. But Metro is a textured vinyl article um, that is in Jurica Plus, yeah. right? Yeah, and that can be bleach cleaned. And we can get you the, the, the details well in terms of a solution that needs to be used for that, absolutely. And we are in the process of testing other products around this. So it's not to say that others can't be bleach cleaned, it's that, again, we're quite stiflers for, for accuracy. Yeah. Um, so we won't tell you a product can be bleach cleaned until we've actually certified it. Yeah, um, but we're working on that right now. Um, there's a lot more questions. I think it'd be best if we did them. Maybe we'll, we'll send we'll send all the answers we'll round Q and A's round to, to everybody. We'll send, we'll send the people that know the answers. <laughs> 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 well, thank you everyone very much for attending this first session. Uh, as we mentioned, we've got one coming up shortly, uh, which is a kind of panel discussion with our two designers, uh, Lisa and Demi, all about the design trends that they are seeing and anticipate in 2021. Uh, and then we have a whole rake of different things going on today and tomorrow involving myself, Steve, and, and loads of other people. More interesting people. Okay. <laughs> so we, we bring in a design team to you as well who are very enthusiastic and passionate about what they do as they should be. Um, and yeah, looking forward to the next few days. So thank you. Thank you guys very much.